Okay. How about Wes on the cello? That was awesome. Is that a cello? What is it? How about Wes on his big old violin? What, what is that? An upright bass. Very nice. I appreciated that. I was like, oh, do we have a drum? No, no, we don't. We have Wes on his violin. Oh, it is. <laughs> well, I'm so glad to see everybody this morning. Thanks for being here. Braving, like literally enduring hardships for Christ. Daylight savings time. It's spring break. A cold front. Like y'all are committed, dedicated Christians right now. I'm impressed. Uh, my name's Tammy Overhauser. I'm part of the leadership team here and part of the teaching team. Uh, Dave, Donnie Mabe, and myself uh, on the rotating on the teaching team. I'm super honored to be part of that and here with you this morning. Uh, we are we're gonna dive right in. We are week four. Four weeks into our habit series, and we detoxed in January and February, and now we're discussing good spiritual habits to adopt and add back in. Dave introduced the series by saying God wants us to grow, and we grow by doing what? Uh, Dave talked to us about getting in the Word of God, and then Donnie talked to us about uh, spending time in prayer two weeks ago, and then last week, Dave talked to us about discipleship, by intentionally having somebody investing into your life, and then also doing that for others. Uh, I loved his story last week, uh, saying he called Jay Springer to help him with his little DIY project, because Jay knew more than he did and could coach him through it. And then when I was preparing, it made me think of the scripture in Ecclesiastes, it says, two are better than one. Because they have a good return for their labor, and if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. And then I thought, oh, maybe Jay should have actually gone over to Dave's house in case he literally fell (laughs) off his ladder. He could literally help him up, literally and figuratively. Um, This morning, I want to talk to you about the habit of engaging in fellowship or gathering together as Christians. The entire Bible, you guys, is the story of God building a family who will love him, honor him, and reign with him forever. Uh, In Scripture, all through the Bible, I could go book by book and show you how he's building a family. Uh, From the beginning in Genesis, we see God with Adam. God had Adam name all the animals, right? And it says that upon doing that, he noticed says he noticed there was no suitable companion for himself. I feel like he probably noticed that there were at least two of every animal, right? And possibly at that point, families of animals coming to him to be named and uh, that there wasn't any suitable companion for himself. There's something unique in human interaction and and the connecting of our souls that nothing else can replace. I mean... Your dog can be your best friend if you want, but I personally think we need, I need other humans to connect with. And in the very next breath in Genesis, we're not going to go there, but quickly in Genesis 2, 20 through 22, 2, 20 through 22, uh, in the next breath, God says, it's not suitable for man to be alone. And then he makes him a wife, a counterpart, someone to fellowship with and interact with and connect with. In the book of Exodus, Moses and his army are at war with the Amalekites. It says when he was holding up his arms and his staff, they would win. And when it would begin to lower, they would get defeated. But his arms were getting weak and growing weary. So his men, his right-hand men, essentially, her and Aaron, brought a rock for him to sit on. And then they held up his arms. For him, the Bible says one on each side, and they defeated the Amalekites. Have you ever felt alone in the world like Adam? Like I have nobody to connect with. Have you ever felt weary from the fight like Moses and wish somebody would come along and lift your arms up? I believe we're wired or created, hardwired, or created, if you will, with that emotion, to feel that emotion because we need each other. We need to need each other, if that makes sense. So let's talk about fellowship for a little bit. When you hear the word fellowship, what comes to mind? I mean, you think like a Christian (laughs) get-together. 
<laughs> the fellowship hall. <laughs> there are donuts and coffee in the fellowship hall. <laughs> I grew up Lutheran, and that's what they would say. Like, what is the fellowship hall where people go, how are you, brother? How are you? Good. How are you? How was your week? Great. How was yours? And they have coffee and donuts, and they call that fellowship. Um, but fellowship, oh, there's Moses. Go to the next one on fellowship. Right? Um, Fellowship has a specific definition and a specific purpose. The Greek word is koinonia, which simply put is communion and partnership with God or communion and partnership with other Christians. When I, when I became a Christian, when you become a Christian, you're invited into this great fellowship with God. You're invited into a relationship with him. You and God are now in a relationship, and you get to know him, and his presence draws near to you, and you feel it in your life, and you're encouraged, and you feel love, and you feel excited, and then you're also called to partner with him. Then you're invited into the Great Commission. You're, it's not just... Let's sit, there's another word for let's just sit there and love each other. But this is literally a relationship and a partnership. So we are tight, and then we're also engaging the world around us. What, what, what's your plan? There's all of a sudden this bigger plan that I'm now a part of, that my eyes are open to, that I get to be involved in. And then I'm, in, I'm shown in the Bible to invite others into this relationship with me. Now we all do the same. We live our life together. And we enjoy each other, and we partner in his work, in the Great Commission, and in glorifying him with our relationship and how we interact one to another. That's fellowship. If you have your Bible or an app, will you turn with me or swipe with me? <laughs> in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. This passage of scripture comes early in the book of Acts, early in history of the new church, which is the account of the building of the very first church after Jesus' death and resurrection. Peter preaches a strong message in Jerusalem where it says 3,000 people get saved and are added to their number. And now Luke, who wrote Acts, records for us what took place and shows us how to do church. Read this with me. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, it's in here. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> they were selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. I want to pay close attention to verse 22 for a minute. I'm going to read it again. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. I mean, if you were just to ask me early on, on the spot, off the top of my head, what does it mean to be a Christian? I would probably say things like, you should read your Bible. Read your Bible. <laughs> Study the Word of God. Go to church. Yes. Um... Also prayer. Also we should pray, yes. <laughs> like Without any teaching or instructing or studying the Bible a lot, you're a new Christian, you're like, I know I'm probably supposed to read. I know I'm probably supposed to pray. But Luke listed here fellowship even before prayer. Not, I'm not saying it's a priority, but it's listed even before prayer. In every version I look up, it says to be devoted to these things. Devote yourself to these things. Dave talked about the importance of reading the Bible. Donnie talked to us about adopting a strong prayer life. But now what about this concept of fellowship? Because it's listed right there, right between read the Bible and pray. And they were devoted to it. I looked up the word devoted, and it is defined like this. To attend to constantly with prevailing strength. 
given that definition, y'all, what are you devoted to? I'm like, what are some things I've devoted to? My workout? (laughs) To attend to constantly with prevailing strength. Coffee? Like, like, I don't know, given that context. My loving my husband, raising my children, my workouts, it's all I could think that, like, I attend to constantly. Are we devoted to fellowship, to communing with God and then communing with each other and partnering with you to glorify God in all that we do in our life? And if I'm not devoted to that, why am I not? I just don't have time. I don't make it a priority. What are you dedicated to? We say things like, did you see her or call her today? She's really going through something tough. No, I didn't have time to, but I shot her a text. I don't like fellowship meetings. Kids all run around and it's super loud. There's nothing for me to do there and no one that I like. (laughs) These are things we say, not things I say, although I do say them. (laughs) I've said all these. Last time I went hardly, anyone talk to me. We say that. Does it always have to be spiritual? Can we just hang out? Yes. To answer, your, to answer my rhetorical question, yes, it always has to be spiritual. It should be. Why, why not? Why not? I'm really tired, and I just want to stay in my pajamas on the couch. Let me tell you this. That is where the enemy would love for you to be. Alone with your thoughts so he can come along and pick you off. We're going to talk about this in just a few minutes, but the Bible says where two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. That's where you want to be. Not alone on the couch in your pajamas, scrolling. Don't get me wrong, there's a time. There's a time for that. We have to have downtime. Not everybody is social and gets charged by a big get-together like I do, <laughs> but, but there is a time. Even in a large gathering, you can pair off and talk to people about what's going on in your life. Can you can't bring me that water, David. Bring me the water. Thank you. What are you devoted to? My husband knows that I love the book of Acts, and I say often, why can't I just live there in the book of Acts, in the beginning church? I want to see signs and wonders. I want to see devils cast out of people and thrown into the sea or whatever, whatever you do with them. I want to see 3,000 people added daily to our numbers. I mean, what the heck? Don't you want that? While I was studying for this sermon, my husband walked past me and he said, if you want to look like the church of Acts, you need to act like the church of Acts. <laughs> Very matter-of-factly. He just walked. He didn't remember saying it. I said, I'm going to quote you. I said, what did I say? He said, if you want to look like the church of Acts, you need to act like the church of Acts. Shout out, browser. <laughs> <laughs> My slides aren't always spiritual. <laughs> we can see in Scripture that the early Christians were meeting and sharing their needs, praying with each other, discussing the word in order to encourage and comfort and edify each other. They all brought everything they had. Like I want to say, they brought their A game. They didn't hold anything back. They were not looking out for their own interests, it says in Philippians. Not wondering, what's in this for me? How am I going to go to this meeting and be blessed and receive. They, they were not looking out for their own interests. The Bible says that they were assembling together as a whole body and that they were assembling in small groups as well. Hebrews 10.25 says they were in small groups. It's as if they knew they needed each other for survival. I need y'all for survival. I really, really do. If you want to know what fellowship is supposed to look like played out, come to one of our deeper meetings. That's what it looks like. Once a month or so, we get together in fellowship at Dave and April's house. It's called Deeper. And I so appreciate how they intentionally, it feels intentional to me, they turn the atmosphere towards God. Dave will either give a message or there'll be a theme or the one night we did baptisms. God is always there. Because look, y'all, we could gather 
We could gather. We could swim and grill out. That's called a barbecue. <laughs> we, could, we could meet for drinks and go to happy hour. We totally could do that. That's happy hour. We could get in a running group together and go running. That's our running group. We could knit. And it, it's, not, it's not a fellowship, but it doesn't necessarily have to not be one. It could be fellowship. Is your heart, I don't know about happy hour, but you work that, you work that out. Is your heart turned towards God? Is your conversation about him and his plans for you, is he being glorified in what you're doing and what you're saying? Do you leave feeling built up and strengthened and loved and comforted and equipped for the work that you're doing? Look what happens when we devote ourselves to fellowship. I met my friend Marissa. In fact, um, I met her at David April's house. And we bonded over our love of frosted flakes. Let me tell you, any woman who can bring a box of frosted flakes and a gallon of milk to a party, <laughs> we are it's my soulmate, basically. <laughs> We're soulmates. I was like, yes, Bay, me too. That's what I want to do. And also our love of reality TV. But it didn't stop there. That's the natural, right? It's okay to be like, hey, you like to work out? Me too. Let's work out. Hey, what's God doing? What are we doing for him? How is this glorifying him? Not our, not our run, not our, our knitting, not our whatever the group might be, but how is God being glorified? By our union, the two of us or the 80 of us. Marissa and I didn't stay there. We laughed, but we, um, what did Marissa and I do? <laughs> we soon were talking about God and what he has for us and how and when we came to know him and what that felt like and how it changed our lives. And our hearts are knit together, not by our love of cereal, although that is a strong bond, but because of our mutual relationship with Christ and the great things he's doing in and through us. You leave having connected to the creator and to each other, and then he's glorified. That's fellowship. It's a relationship and a partnership. Like, we're in this together. Let's, we're in this together, right? Let's be in this together. If you don't like being together or loud music or it always being spiritual, you are not going to like heaven, I'm just going to tell you. Because <laughs> we're together forever. So let's like each other <laughs> and glorify him, right? Every time I get together with Rachel, she's over in the nursery, um, we always talk about our families and what it's like to raise strong men for the Lord but we talk about our victories and our struggles and how God is our source of daily strength. And she'll always share scripture with me. She'll go, I have to tell you my God parenting moment this week. I'm like, I need to hear it. Tell me. And it encourages me and I'm built up and we rejoice in the work we're doing. It reminds me of his goodness. Matthew 18, 20 says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Do you know what I used to think this said? Where two or more are gathered together, there he is. It's not. When two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. This is why we fellowship. This is why it is spiritual. This is why it needs to include him. You know that feeling that you get when we worship? The room is thick. The air feels thick. It almost feels like time stands still a little bit. That's the presence of God. And I feel that. I feel that when I fellowship. I feel, who was I with? Another friend of ours. She's not here this morning. And we talked about our children. And then... Where were we at? Red, right at Red Horn Coffee Shop. <laughs> we sat there and we talked about our children. We talked about parenting. We talked about struggles. And then we prayed for a really, really, really long time. Like I was like, this is awkward. We're awkward here at Red Horn. And, and then we hugged for an equally long time. And I felt the presence of God there in our, at our little coffee table. I felt the presence of God. And I opened my eyes and I looked around me and I thought, huh. Right here at Redhorn. That's fellowship. Two or more are gathered together in my name. There I am in their midst. 
The other week, I was going through my own rough patch. I was really, really down, very, very low. And April knew it, and she invited me to lunch. I got there early because she was like, want to meet for lunch? And then I was like, click, ah, teleported myself to Torchy's. And then she was like, calm down. I meant like in three hours or so. But I was there early. <laughs> and the lady brought me chips. And then I started to cry because I couldn't eat them because I'm basically allergic to everything on the face of the earth. And so, you know, then you're like, insult to injury. I can't even eat the chips. And I spiraled there all by myself at the bar at Torchy's. Waiting for April. <laughs> I was like, I ate my life. Uh, and then April got there, and we said, let's order queso. So we ordered queso. And I'm like, sure, you know, like all, all whatever the word, self-deprecating. I'm like, that's fine. You go ahead. I can't eat it. And she's like, no, girl. And right out of her bag, gluten-free chips in her bag. She popped them open right at the bar. I was like, I don't think we can do this. We can do this. We're doing it. We pushed those nasty... Corn chips, whatever. And, <laughs> but we talked about my issues. We talked about her issues. And then, do you know what happens? That's not where we stop. It's never where we stop. April and I, we work hard as what April calls church ladies. And sometimes we want to say, let's not talk about children's church curriculum. Or let's not talk about the women's retreat. Blah, blah, blah. Let's just go have fun. But we never say... Let's not talk about God. Like, that, that's unheard of for us. And we never say, let's talk about God. It just comes out of us. It should be the overflow of what's already in you. And I need to find somebody else who is overflowing. So we can overflow right there at the bar at Torchies about what God is doing. About what God is doing about how we're partnering. That's exciting to us to partner in what he's doing. And it reminds us that he is bigger than our problems. He is bigger than us, and we can rest in that. We talk about our plans and purposes for the church and how excited we are to be co-laboring in this together with him in the Great Commission. And you know what? My problems, they pale in comparison to all of that. They pale in comparison to the presence of God and knowing that what we're doing is glorifying him. Y'all, that's fellowship. It's fellowship corporately at the deeper meetings. It's fellowship one-on-one because it is not one-on-one. It's three. My arms felt lifted up that day like Moses. The chips she brought me (laughs) tasted like Jesus, I'm going to (laughs) say. I mean, are you hearing me? The Bible says that the Christians in the early church were breaking bread and going from house to house, eating their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. House to house, restaurant to restaurant. (laughs) I told April, thank you so much for inviting me to lunch. Like, Like we're strangers, thank you so much for inviting me to lunch. We could have just texted about this. We could have gone, oh, my day, blah, 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 my kids, blah, 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 blah. We could have done that. And she said, no. I could have texted you from Indiana. This is why we moved here and decided to plant a church together so we could be together. So we could be together. Because where two or more are gathered together in his name, there he is in their midst. It's a partnership. We're co-laboring with Christ, you and I, co-laboring with Christ. And we are moving the ball down the court, the ball, the gospel, his glory. And he is glorified in that. Um, I want April and Sam to come up for a second. You're not in trouble. My kids always go, am I in trouble? No. Brett, will you put the expanded version of Ecclesiastes up there for me? Oh, my gosh. This is the scripture, literally, that we've been going over. In children's church? In children's ministry, yeah, for like the last month. Hmm. The kids better know this. Look at that. (laughs) (laughs) It's a test. It's a test. The Bible says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one, (laughs) fall, Sam, the one (laughs) will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls, and there's not another. There's not another to lift him up. 
Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And I used to feel awkward about that part. I wanted to show you the first sentence and the last sentence and the two lie down together. Have you ever gotten in bed with a sick, hurting child, physically or emotionally hurting, and gotten lied down with them? What about a grieving friend? Have you ever gotten in bed with them or sat there and held them? There's warmth. Didn't you feel warm I and feel cozy? Warm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not... I mean, literally and figuratively, it's not strange. It's right here. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. And a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. I feel warm and cozy right now. I honestly do. You <laughs> can hold you up. You can hold me up. <laughs> That's right. Um, so we're warm and we're cozy. I'm protected. No one's coming here. No one's coming here. And guess what? If one of us gets weary or tired, we can lift our arms. I won't lift your arms. <laughs> we practiced with our sleeves. In all seriousness, we have got her back, her side, her front. You're, are you weary? We'll lift your arms. We have got you. We're two or three are gathered together in his name. There he is in their midst. We've got whatever's coming this way. Let's put Sam in the middle. On, We've got you, Sam. We stand here and we say, not today, Satan. Mm -mm. Nope, you're not taking her. We've got, what, what, no, what, no, no, uh-uh, no. We've got her. There is power. <laughs> There's power in this. This is fellowship. This is why we do this. So you've got a problem, we run. We run and we get alongside. God, stay here. God is building his family. He always has been. We, we see families crumbling all around us, you guys. We as a society are fractured and isolated and lonely more than ever before. The internet and social media has me thinking I have 873 friends. <laughs> <laughs> when really I don't, I have like four, and they're all in this room. <laughs> we should start, you guys can go sit down. We, we should start to look like God's family. Moms and dads, brothers and sisters in Christ, gathered together as if our very life depended on it, as if we need each other. It's been God's plan since the very, very beginning when he said it is not good for man to be alone. We're plan A. I've said this before. We are God's plan A to save the world. We can say, come be with me. Come be with me. Come be with us. Come and be with him. Together, let's do that. And have your lives transformed. The takeaway for us is this. Fellowship should be an important part of your walk with God, along with the Word of God, prayer, and discipleship. Let's devote ourselves to fellowship. Devote ourselves to gathering together and partnering together. What does it look like? Come to a deeper meeting. And if it feels awkward at first, just try turning it Spiritual, just a little tiny bit of a posture, like Dave and Donnie said. Five minutes in the Word. Five minutes in prayer. You don't have to bear your soul with your chips at torchies if that feels raw and strange to you. But come to a meeting and just like get in on a little spiritual conversation. What's God doing? I want to hear. Listen in, maybe. Feel it. Like, you're, it's okay to stand in the presence of the Lord on the edge and feel it, but pretty soon you're going to want to go right in. You're going to want to go right in. Let me tell you what he's doing in my life. Or I want him to do that in my life. I want him to do that in my life. How? Teach me how. We will grab you. <laughs> we, I'll take you. <laughs> Don't ask me unless you're serious, but we will go into the presence of the Lord. He will be glorified. Your life will be changed. Come to a deeper meeting. Meet a friend for lunch. Invite someone over. Invite someone to coffee. Invite another family over and let the kids play and say, what's God doing? 
that might be a strange question. You might, oh, I don't know. Well, what, what is God doing? Your question, your answer might be, I don't know. And then we'll go from there. But when you go to a deeper meeting and you invite a friend to lunch and you invite another couple over, my charge to you is this. Make sure that you are inviting God in as well to experience true fellowship. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for my church and for this fellowship. Thank you for saving me and rescuing me and bringing me into fellowship and modeling this for me. That you invited me in, I can invite others in. God, I pray that our church feels the need to fellowship. And when they do, they feel your presence and that you feel glorified and that our lives are changed forever. In Jesus' name, amen.